This story took place in the town of Dadovsk, near Moscow. In 2005, rumors spread through the streets that a maniac had appeared in the town. Some talked about a gang of Satanists who sacrificed small children, and some about mad doctors who cut out organs from children. The residents of Dadovsk and the surrounding area were badly frightened. Most of the yards were deserted. Some sent their children to their grandmothers in the village. Some simply did not let their offspring out on the street. Many even put out in the courtyard, postovi. That is, while the kids are running around the yard, one of the parents is sure to pass all of them. The children themselves were frightened to death and shunned any strangers like the plague. House 16A on Gagarina Street is a huge high-rise building with communal apartments. Everyone here knows each other. They moved in and met each other when they were young. They got married, had children, and raised them all together. One big family. 11-year-old Pasha Sokolov and the Yelshin brothers, 12-year-old Misha and 10-year-old Sasha also lived there. On July 19, 2005, Sasha and Pasha went to the pond. Misha was at home at the time. According to the brother's mother, Liuba, around 8 o'clock in the evening, there was a knock at the door. Misha rushed to open it. His mother never found out who was behind the threshold. Misha was in slippers and ran out into the street as if he was about to return. But on that day and the next, the boy never returned. Neither did Sasha and Pasha. The parents went to look for their children at half past 12 in the night. They went to the police, but they only took a statement in the morning. And even then, they were in no hurry to look for them. The worried parents told them to call the Istra police to join the search. But three days later, when asked, is Strinsky looking for Major from the grandfather's department called there? And he was answered, what children? Oh yes, we forgot. It turns out that they were not even looking for them. Parents and the whole house themselves combed the forest, ponds, the whole area around. It was only on the sixth day that the police caught on. They toured the surrounding villages, combed the ponds. They found out from a witness that Misha jumped on an electric train and left towards Istra alone. The parents went to a clairvoyant, a hundred-year-old grandmother who was shown photos of the children said that she saw a cross over Misha, while the rest of the boys were clear. Soon, the cozy green town of Dadovsk was hung with announcements made by parents. The boys are missing, help! And three photos. Everyone wanted to hope for the best, that the boys set up a secret camp somewhere in the forest and enjoy playing Indians or Tom Sawyer, that it's just the stupidity of young people who didn't think about the suffering they caused their relatives, but the tragedy that happened not so long ago in Krasnoyarsk with five children burned in a sewer makes us think about the terrible. And the terrible has come. In the leaflets that were posted around the city, Mikhail Yelshin was soon circled with a red felt-tip pen. On July 29th, the boy was found dead on a vacant lot near the cemetery near the village of Luzki. The mother was invaded to the identification but the prosecutor's office could not show her son's body in its entirety. The hands, feet, and face were covered with a sheet. Misha, 12, was found wearing the same red t-shirt and gray shorts with orange zippers in which he left home. Speculation arose. The disfigured hands and feet suggest the boy had been tortured, nailed to a cross or to a tree. Perhaps the murderer or murderers were either performing a bloody ritual or were specifically trying to make the murder look satanic. The preliminary version of the boy's death was considered asphyxiation. However, experts are convinced that not suffocation was the cause of death at all. Most likely, the teenager died two days ago, unable to withstand inhuman torture. Misha was found by guest workers from the construction site of a cottage village near the village of Lushki in the Istra district. In the woods on a hill, about a hundred meters from the local cemetery, the operative investigative group of the prosecutor's office of the Moscow region started working there. 
Experts combed the forest and the adjacent field literally square by square, looked for any evidence that could shed light on the mystery of the terrible crime. The members of the search group searched the forest and the surrounding area with the help of a metal detector, hoping to find a secret underground cache where they could keep the guys. It was also said that they were looking for nails of unusual shape and size, possibly used in the crucifixion. But soon after the examination, it was found that the boy died of asphyxia, and the mutilations were traces of animal bites. Rumors growing like a snowball are the only thing adding to the missing persons case. The investigation hasn't moved a step forward. Unfortunately, this is largely because people who know something important often choose to keep quiet. For example, a woman who lives in the same house with the parents of the missing boys recalled that she saw one of the workers who were doing repairs, often gave the boys money, and then she was afraid. Why did I say that? I set up a good man. No one argues. Maybe the builder is really a good man, but the one who did this to Misha may have been a good man too, and maybe someone saw him, but is afraid to say, not wanting to offend the innocent. The parents were sure that Sashenka and Pavlik were alive. They were hiding somewhere and were waiting for help. Maybe in the basement of some cottage, there are plenty of them near the place where Misha was found. But the police don't check basements. They're not looking for children, but for corpses. They're combing the sewers. It seems that the guards of order have already buried the boys. But the parents believe. The clairvoyant told them that there are two people who know exactly where the boys are. They saw everything, but are afraid to tell. The Yelshins and Sokolovs were ready to pay any money for the slightest information about their children, alive or dead, and were also willing to buy Pavlik and Sasha from the kidnappers. Let them name the price. For the parents, the children's lives are priceless. But in reality, the children had already been killed. Two months later, the bodies of Sokolov and Yelshin Jr. were found by police on September 30th at about 9 p.m. near the village of Kriukovo. The dead children were found in a field near a forest area and a power line mast. Their bodies were covered with leaves. It is worth noting that the place where they were found is about 1.5 kilometers away from the place where Mikhail Yelshin was found. He was found near the village of Luzhki. It is unknown why the police, who had combed these places several times, did not find the bodies of the children earlier. All that investigators knew was that the three children, brothers Mikhail and Alexander Yelshins, and their buddy Pavel Sokolov, lived with their parents in Dodovsk in the dormitory of a weaving factory. One of the neighbors interviewed after their disappearance recalled that on the evening of July 19th, he saw a tall man enter the dormitory. A few minutes later, he allegedly came out accompanied by Misha Yelshin. His brother Alexander Yelshin and Pavel Sokolov were walking in the street at that time. Apparently, the younger joined Mikhail and his companion, and all three went to the railroad station. According to the assumption of the investigators, in the evening of July 19th, the children went by train from the town of Dadovsk to the reservoir located near the village of Snagiri. In the evening, the children did not return home. And that's all. No suspects, no evidence, nothing the investigation had. Here I thought, dear listeners of my channel, that the story is over. But four years later, all the secret became clear. 2009. May 14th. 14-year-old Anna Murenkova disappeared. Her body was found on May 22nd near the Moscow suburb of Snagiri. The girl was brutally raped and strangled on the day of her disappearance, May 14th. After that, the perpetrator drove her by car from Moscow to Istrinsky district, where he dumped her on the territory of the dump. On suspicion of committing the murder, investigators detained a 23-year-old resident of Moscow, who is the uncle of the murdered girl. Alexei Kruglov, 23, was detained at the end of May, shortly after random passers-by discovered the corpse of his niece, Anya, in a wooded area near the village of Snagiri. 
The girl had been missing for several days. She had gone to school and did not return. It turned out that the uncle offered to drive the girl to an educational institution, and he himself raped and then abused his niece for several days. Then the uncle strangled the unfortunate and took her body to the Istra district. The scoundrel immediately confessed to the murder. Alexei was the brother-in-law of Anya's mother. Moreover, he started communicating with the schoolgirl's family two weeks before the crime. Until then, he lived with his father in another city. By the way, according to neighbors Anna, the guy made a positive impression and in public was very worried about the missing niece. It turned out that the place where the villain brought the corpse of the girl, he chose not by chance. There, he had already sent innocent children to the grave. When one of the policemen asked if the murder of three boys from Dedovsk four years ago was not his doing, the murderer nodded affirmatively and began to describe the scene of the massacre of the children. But about it a little later, it turns out this story began not in 2005 and much earlier in 2003. And now, everything in order, what the investigation has established. As follows from the case file, Alexei Krugloff committed his first crime on August 25, 2003, in his dacha house in the gardening community Polyanka of Istrinsky district of Moscow region. Then the young man, who was 17 years old, strangled with a rope a nine-year-old boy who was a guest of his neighbors. After that, the criminal took the corpse of the child out of the house, put it in the trunk of the car, Zaz 11102 Tavria, and drove the body to a forest area. However, during the trial, this episode was excluded because the investigators could not prove Kruglov's guilt. He was found guilty on the other four episodes. The next crime was committed on July 19, 2005. One of the neighbors interviewed by the police recalled that Mikhail Yelshin was taken out of the house by a tall man he did not know, and on the street they were joined by Yelshin Jr. and Sokolov. All four allegedly went in the direction of the railway station. However, as established by the employees of the ICS, the neighbor was mistaken. That day, Kruglov again went to his dacha. Not far from the village Snegiri on Rozdestvenskoye Highway in Istrinsky district of Moscow region, he saw three boys aged 10 and 13 years old who were returning home after swimming. The maniac offered to give the teenagers a lift to the nearest railway station, and the children agreed. However, instead of the promised station, the killer drove towards his dasha. Stopping on the way, he locked the oldest boy in the trunk of the car and then took the two remaining children out of the car one by one and strangled them in cold blood with a man's shirt. The maniac, confident of his impunity, killed the third boy only the next day. In the morning, he let the captive out of the trunk and drove with him to the village of Lushki, where he stopped near the cemetery. There, Kruglov struck the child with a shoelace. On May 14, 2009, Alexei Kruglov offered his 14-year-old niece, his sister's daughter, with whom he lived in a Moscow apartment, a ride to school. On the way, he stopped near a house on Sharikopod Shipnikovskaya Street. Here, the man put a lanyard from a computer flash drive around the girl's neck and strangled her. After that, he took the corpse to the same place where he hid the bodies of other victims, in the forest near Polyanka. To hide the corpse from prying eyes, Kruglov covered it with a car seat and a suitcase found nearby at the dump. The murder of the girl was solved on hot tracks. It turned out that Kruglov was the last person she talked to on the cell phone. After detention, the Muscovite confessed to the other murders as well. During the investigation and trial, Kruglov tried to commit suicide several times. Thus, on the eve of sentencing, while being transported in a convoy car, he wounded himself in the neck. However, the wound turned out to be not life-threatening. According to the conclusion of doctors, the suicide was demonstrative in nature. Kruglov was treated and continued to be tried. The court found Alexei Kruglov sane and, 
agreeing with the opinion of the state prosecutor, sentenced him to life imprisonment. Support the video with a like and the channel with a subscription. And all the best to you. Be careful.